Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, this third workshop in a series of Introduction to Data Science workshop series put on by the CALS Visualization Core Labs. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the CALS uh, Visualization Core Laboratory, KVL. And I am also a certified instructor with Software and Data Carpentry. Software and Data Carpentry are two uh, global nonprofit organizations whose um, whose goal is to teach foundational scientific computing and data science and machine learning skills to uh, researchers and academia or industry, um, really anybody who is looking to uh, get started on the right path with, um, with scientific computing, data science and machine learning. So today's topic is going to be an introduction to Python. So our previous two workshops started with an introduction to Shell. And then we built on that introduction to Shell, and I taught you an introduction to Conda, which is a tool for managing your Python um, and other languages, but we are using primarily for, for Python uh, software stacks. And it's the tool that you will need to use to install um, all of the software that we're going to use this, uh, this semester kind of locally on your own computers, laptops, workstations, what have you. Uh, but you can also use that tool to install software on remote clusters at maybe your university or your um, or your company or in the cloud. So that was last week. This week is going to be about Python. And um, I really kind of want to get moving because we have a lot of material to cover. And I know everyone is, is typically very excited for the Python course. Um, um, relative to some of these other tools. Although Python, it's important to remember that Python is only one tool in, a, uh, in the toolbox and you do need to have uh, some level of fluency in other tools as well to be uh, as productive and effective as possible. But today we're gonna talk about Python. So we're gonna be using the plotting and programming in Python notes. Uh, these are developed by the software carpentry community. Uh, I myself have contributed um, a fair number of content to these uh, to these uh, episodes. Now, if you glance through, um, you can see that there's quite a lot of material to cover. And in fact, typically this would be a full day workshop to cover all of this material from start to finish without skipping anything. So obviously today we do not have a full day. We only have about half a day. And so what I will be doing is jumping around quite a bit uh, in these lectures. So I'm going to pick and choose the topics that I, um, I think are um, uh, the most, not necessarily the most important, but the ones where I feel like you will benefit the most from having my instruction. So if I skip a lesson, it's not because I don't think it's important. It's more because I feel like that lesson is fairly self-contained. And if you were to go back to it with the knowledge that you'll take away from from this afternoon, you won't have any trouble kind of going through that episode and understanding what's going on. So I'm going to try to focus my time with you on teaching you those episodes that uh, are a bit trickier, perhaps. Um, now, in terms of setup, so if you want to uh, follow along uh, on your local computer after the workshop is done, then you will need to go through and download the uh, Python novice Gapminder data and walk through the, the setup instructions, which will explain um, how to install uh, Anaconda or Miniconda and on your different op various operating systems and where to download the data. We don't have to do any of that today. And in fact, if you're quite happy to work in the cloud, then you can come back and use these cloud resources as, as often as you wish. These cloud resources, the public binder hub is always available uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, seven days a week. So if you want to come back and use these cloud, uh, the cloud resources to follow along, then that's great. You can do that too. In fact, that's probably what I would do, uh, particularly if you're, as you're just getting started. Okay. So without uh, further ado, let's just go ahead and get started. So we're going to start with uh, running and quitting. So in this episode, I'm going to talk about Python programs. Um, we are going to talk about primarily about JupyterLab and how to use JupyterLab and how to use uh, how to start notebooks and how to start Python scripts and, and things like this. And so you're going to see how to do all those things. 
and how to navigate around in, in JupyterLab. Okay. So uh, JupyterLab is what we have running in the browser over here. So it is a browser-based kind of uh, integrated development environment that is, is the most widely, one of the most widely used tools for um, interacting with and doing Python development. So the um, JupyterLab is, uh, is something that you install via Conda. And in fact, if you remember from last week, we had Conda environment files and talked about how to build environments from uh, these files using Conda. Um, inside the environment.yaml is where you would list the, uh, the particular version of JupyterLab that you, that you wish to, to use. And so in fact, you can see I've just listed JupyterLab here, as well as all the other dependencies that we're going to make use of today. Um, and this also demonstrates in JupyterLab, you can open files. So if you click on files, um, they will open here. Um, you could edit them. Uh, if you wish, you could go in here and add more dependencies if you wish. So you can use JupyterLab as a text editor. Um, and it has some nice syntax highlighting. So it, um, JupyterLab understands Python scripts, YAML files, markdown files, plain text files, all kinds of, of different text files and has provides kind of a nice experience similar to what you might have from your standard uh, various text editors. Okay. Um, so there's a, some discussion here about starting JupyterLab. We don't have to do that. JupyterLab is already running for us because this command was run um, on Binder Hub for us behind the scenes. But if you want to start JupyterLab on your local machine, uh, this is the section that describes how to do that. Um, it's important to note that JupyterLab is just a, it's a browser-based uh, program, but it doesn't require an internet connection. So here we need an internet connection because we are, the, we are running um, our, um, our computations are gonna be running on remote uh, servers in a cloud. But if you're running this locally, you don't need an internet connection to, to run. JupyterLab, but it does run in the browser. So there's some screenshots on how to do that. So the JupyterLab interface, so that's kind of what I want to talk about right now, just to make everybody um, a bit more familiar. So at the top, you have a standard menu bar. So this is where you have your file, your edit, view, run, and, and so on and so forth. Um, your help, uh, help menus. Um, some of these help menus will take you to links um, online. So to access those online uh, help manuals, you would need an internet connection for that. Um, you'll notice that some of these options are grayed out. That just means that those options are not relevant given the current uh, state of our, our Jupyter Lab. Um, we haven't opened any notebooks or text files or things. So there's nothing to save, um, for example. And edit. So editing is something that is uh, has a lot of the the uh, things that you'll do in Jupyter notebooks. So when you open a Jupyter notebook, which we'll do in a minute, all of these things will will be available for you to select them and whatnot. Okay. Um, so the left sidebar. So the left sidebar is this area here. And depending on how you've configured your Jupyter Lab, you might have many, many, many options here, or you just might have a few. The, um, the ones that are most relevant is the file browser. So you might use the file browser uh, quite a lot. Um, so you can toggle the file browser on and off to kind of give yourself more space. And this is what's called the main work area. Um, or you can open it up and then you can use the file browser just as you would uh, with your mouse. You can double click on a directory um and navigate through the file browser in that fashion and you can click on the the little folder here it'll take you back to kind of the what you can think of as being kind of the, the home directory um within your jupyter uh um, your jupyter lab environment if you have different Jupyter Lab extensions installed, then you might have some other options down here. I'm not going to talk too much about uh, Jupyter Lab extensions today, except just to mention that there is a huge ecosystem 
of like uh, packages that add extra functionality to JupyterLab. It's one of the main um, selling points of, of JupyterLab is that there's such a large community that's constantly improving and adding different features and extensions and things like that. Okay, we'll use a couple of these extensions and uh, in future training. So when we talk about Git next week, we'll be using the JupyterLab Git extension and we talk about uh, SQL the week after that, we'll be using some uh, JupyterLab SQL extensions to, uh, to write SQL code in JupyterLab. Okay, so the main work area. So the main work area is, um, is just this, this area here. It's where you're going to launch notebooks or consoles um, or a terminal window, things of this nature. So if we wanted to, um, for example, launch a notebook in the um, in a particular directory, we could navigate to that directory. So if we go to introduction to Python and then go into notebooks, we could click the notebook button and that would launch a Jupyter notebook. So we'll use this Jupyter notebook um, for our working area. And you can do things like rename your notebook. So if you right click, on the name of the notebook, you'll have a, a handy menu will, will pop up and you can go down and do things like rename. And I will just call this uh, sandbox because this will be my, my coding sandbox today. And I will post this notebook um, online later today. And then you hit enter and now you've renamed and you can see how the, the name has changed up here. Okay. so. We've opened a notebook, but we've launched our, or we've lost our launcher. Um, I guess before I move on, so if you want to save, so when your Jupyter notebook has a little dot up here, that means that you have unsaved changes. You can save this notebook by either hitting um, Command or Control S. And if you go to File now, you'll see all of these things are, um, um, are not, um, not grayed out. So now you can just click on save notebook um, or you can use the, the keyboard shortcut here, which I'm using a Mac. So this says command S or shift command S to save a notebook as a different name, things like this. So this is all very similar to other kinds of, of programs that you will have, have used. Okay. So uh, I mentioned that we lost our, um, we opened a notebook, but we lost our, our launcher window, which is what this main uh, workspace looks like. So to get that back, you can just click this, you can toggle the file browser open, and then you can click this blue button, which gives you a launcher. Um, and then you could do things like if you wanted to launch a, um, if you wanted to create a Python script, for example, um, inside of a source uh, directory, or let's just create our, um, let's just create our Python script here, for example, then we could, um, then we could just click on this text file and you'll see it opens up a text file here and we could rename this and I'll call this um, script. Spell it correctly, script.py. Okay, and so now you'll notice that when I call something .py, so a little Python symbol came up here. So that's because JupyterLab is, is obviously Python aware. And so now if I was type Python code, which we'll learn about in a minute, but if I just did something like print, um, hello world, um, from inside a script, something like this. And then again, I can save it with the control command control or command S. And so then this is how you might write a, a Python script. Uh, um, and so you open text files, you save them as .py files, and then you can write whatever you want for your, your Python script. Okay. So Jupyter Notebooks, we, we talked about Jupyter Notebooks um, uh, already. So I um, don't want to go uh, too much more into that. 
So let's open up uh, another launcher window and we'll go ahead and open a console. So if you've used Python, if you, some of you may have used Python before, you may have been used to using Python from um, a kind of a console uh, environment. Those console environments are available here as well. So you can click on a console and this will launch uh, an IPython console. Um, and then here you can type Python commands like print um, hello world. And then um, the command line is, or the, the box here is multi line or multi, a multi line editor. So you can add things like um, here's another line of text. And now, if you want to evaluate this Python code that you've typed in here, you can hit shift and enter. And that Python code will be evaluated here for you interactively. So when you're working with consoles, you can do things interactively. When you're working with scripts, you tend to write like a long script and then you would run the script. And you can actually run the script from the console. So here, the, the console um, was started within the same directory in which the script is, is, was, uh, was created. So if I just do um, run uh, script.py, then that executes the script as if I had typed all of the commands uh, here. Yeah. Um, and if you had created a script somewhere else, for example, if I went um, over here and I created a script in this introduction to Python source directory, so, um, I will save this as um, another script. And then in here, I will just put, you know, print uh, hello again from this other script. And I'll save that. And now if I go back to the console, I should be able to run, um, run the script by passing in the path to that other script. So if you remember back from our bash training, dot dot was a, a way that you reference the parent directory in which you are of the directory in which you're currently running. So there I'm passing a, this is called a relative path to the script that I want to run, and then it executes. Okay. Um, what else? If you wanted to see what command, what directory you're in, you can type uh, pwd. So many of the, the common Linux uh, bash commands that we learned uh, two weeks ago are actually what are called um, IPython magic commands and they're available and you can actually run them uh, within IPython. Um, another one would be uh, LS. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that you can do with, uh, with JupyterLab is that you can actually arrange all of these different um, uh, well, let's get rid of that script. I want to launch one more thing. So a terminal. Um, but I would like to, the terminal to be in a different um, directory. So here's a term. Here's a terminal. Terminal is what we used uh, the last two weeks primarily. So you guys should be a little bit. For those of you who have come before, you should be familiar with the terminal. One of the things that you can do in JupyterLab is actually arrange these tabs. So here I have all these different tabs like in a browser and I can go back and forth like this and that's okay. Um, but I might prefer to arrange my tabs in a different way. So for example, I might prefer to have a, um, a Python console here and um, then JupyterLab here. And let's see, get rid of this. And eventually I will get there. Okay. 
There we go. So you can kind of drag these these around. And so if you wanted to have a, a, um, a notebook up here, and maybe maybe instead of a terminal, you prefer to have um, you prefer to have a script. So I could then um, open this script and then drag the script down here. And so I could have this kind of a working environment. So you can kind of configure this around to as much as you want. Um, so if you wanted to have a notebook here, um, a console down here, a script over here, however you might want to work. Um, there are other extensions that support different kinds of plotting um, to have um, plotting windows over here that will update as you run your as you run your commands, things like this. So you can kind of configure it however you want. Uh, there's a link here to the official documentation for, for more detailed examples. So here's a, a screenshot of what's called a widget, where there is an, a, a notebook for solving the, uh, the Lorenz uh, equations, and then a, a script that does some plotting. And then this widget allows you to toggle the different parameters of, the, um, of that model to see how the, this is called a, a chaotic attractor, would change uh, depending on the values of those parameters, that kind of a thing. So if you want to get a sense of, um, of how JupyterLab works, then please take a look at the official docs. OK. Um, what I want to do now, just take a quick three minutes and allow you to play around with, with JupyterLab a little bit. So I'll, I'll take a look. I think there might be some questions in the chat. So I'll take a look at those. Um, but just take a minute to play around with JupyterLab, see you know, what kind of combinations of the notebooks and consoles and scripts you know, looks good for you. Um, and just experiment with the different features of JupyterLab. Uh, and I will set a little timer for uh, for three minutes to give you some time to do that. And I'll take a look at what questions we have. Oh, okay, so uh, there's a question from Sammy. I missed how you opened the console. So all of the, um, whether it's a notebook or a console or a terminal or a text file, they are all opened from um, the, uh, the launcher menu. And de depending on where you are in the file system, when you click this blue button, you get a launcher menu. So here, I'm, my file browser has me in kind of the, the root directory yeah, of the file system. And so when I click the blue button, I get a launcher that has no path at the top. But if I had gone into the introduction to Python um, directory and click the launcher, I get another launcher that now is launching these things from inside the introduction to Python directory. But everything is launched from the, uh, the launcher menu. Ah, uh, uh, Shuk has a question. How did you submit what you wrote in the console? So, that's a good question. Um, I probably did it without even mentioning it. Um, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but whether you're in a console or a Jupyter notebook, um, you submit things by um, shift and enter. Oh, I seem to have lost my kernel over here. So there, so you get eight. If for some reason you lost your, you had no kernel over here, if you just click this and select Python three, um, then that's that's all you need to do. And similarly, if I was to launch um, uh, a console, if you type four plus four and hit shift and enter, then it will evaluate that. Okay. Uh, someone cannot see the bin directory. So there is inside, so there's there's two bin directories. So one bin directory is for the whole uh, repo, but then there is a separate bin directory, which I think is empty. Um, oh. 
inside the introduction to Python directory. So if you click at any time, if you click this folder, it should take you back to the um, that directory. So again, if anybody is um, ever needs to get the links, then the links are from the uh, Introduction to Data Science Workshop uh, repo. So I'll put that link back into the chat just for anybody who is uh, um, who needs it again. Okay, so let's um, let's move along. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure everybody is muted for background noise. Um, there might be some background noise here. Um, my lawn is being mowed at the moment, which is uh, a bit unfortunate. Um, right, okay, so using the Jupyter Notebook for running and editing code. So we're gonna work today primarily in the, the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different modes of, of Jupyter Notebook. So uh, when you're using Jupyter, you have uh, different kinds of cells and you type things into the cells and then you use shift and enter to execute what is in that cell. So if we wanted to do hello world. You type the command print by the string you want in the string you want to print and you hit shift and enter and then that executes the uh, that executes that command and then returns that to you in the output cell. And you can toggle output cells by clicking this little blue box over here. Similarly, you can hide input cells by clicking this little box here. We all back? Not quite sure what happened there, but my Zoom meeting just died on me. Um, but it came back, and we're still recording, so that's that's positive. Um, so let me share my screen, and just I guess we'll just pretend like that didn't happen, um, and hope that it doesn't happen again. So the notebook has two modes: command mode and edit mode. So um, when you're in edit mode, you're actually editing a cell. So you're you know you're typing things like um, you know, some mathematical equations um, or simple arithmetic, things like this. And you hit shift enter and you evaluate it. Now when you're in command, so edit mode is indicated by this blue box. So when your cell has got this blue box around it, it means you're in edit mode. Yeah. Now when you're in command mode, and you can toggle to command mode by hitting escape and notice that this blue uh, bar over here, which indicates kind of where you are in the notebook is still there, but that blue box is gone. So if I click in here again, I go to edit mode and I get my blue box back. If I hit escape, then I'm in command mode and there's no blue box. So I'll just put a comment so in here that says here is a cell. Okay, now I'm typing things in edit mode. If I hit escape, and then you can use keys, um, um, different kind of uh, shortcut keys to do things like create a cell above the previous cell by pressing A. Um, or if I went back to the cell and I hit escape to go to command mode and hit B, I would create a new cell below that current cell. Um, so if I went in here and said, here uh, is a cell that I want to remove. So if I wanted to remove this cell, then I would hit escape to go to command mode and then X, and that would delete the cell. 
And if I wanted to undo that, because actually I really didn't want to delete that cell, I can just hit escape to make sure I'm in command mode and hit Z and that undoes the deletion. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of these shortcut keys. Um, if you go to the help menu, um, there is um, uh, um, different uh, help menus in here, the Jupyter reference, um, things like that, that will tell you about some of these, uh, these shortcut keys. Um, there's some more information in the, in the notes over here um, about different, um, uh, different shortcut keys and things like that. So in addition to code cells, so if I hit escape and then below, I'll create a new cell. And then uh, in addition to code cells, JupyterLab has markdown cells. So markdown is how you can intersperse code and documentation. So if I wanted to make this a markdown cell, I can either go up here where it says code and change it to markdown. And then if I am in here, I can type things like here um, is a header in markdown. And if I hit shift and enter, then this gives me a markdown cell that has you know, a header in it. And you can do all kinds of stuff in markdown. Um, so let's say I wanted to create a new markdown cell below this. So I can, again, either go up here and go to code markdown or in command mode, I can hit, or in edit mode, I can hit escape to go to command mode and hit M. And then that converts this to a markdown. So uh, this is another markdown cell. Uh, here's some uh, regular text. Uh, you can make bulleted lists or numbered lists. One, two, etc. And if you hit shift and enter, then that evaluates that. So that you can also do um, unordered lists. So if I double click on the cell, I can go in and edit it again. So you can also make unordered lists with asterisks. So one. Two, three, like this. Um, you can do sub lists. If you wanted to have um, a, a subheading, you do two um, of the, the hash symbols. So this is a subheading. Um, uh, and you do three of them. This is a sub subheading and etc. So you can kind of make this out as format it however you want, subject to the constraints of, of Markdown. And actually Mark, Markdown um, allows you to put uh, not entirely, um, allows you to put HTML, embed HTML within Markdown cells as well. So if you know HTML, you can customize uh, some HTML code in here, and it would also uh, render as expected. You can add links, um, images, all kinds of stuff. Um, so there's some exercises here, um, but in the interest of time, I actually want to, um, well, actually, no, I'll let, give you three minutes to take a look at these exercises. Um, so the exercises, there's some stuff on Markdown, um, but then just get some practice of switching between command mode and edit mode, write some simple arithmetic expressions, use Python like a calculator uh, and evaluate the expressions, get used to the shift enter mode of evaluating expressions um, and, uh, and things like that. Um, I guess one other thing I'll show you is this, this last uh, section here. In, so you can embed math equations So uh, you can embed math equations using uh, LaTeX. And if you want to have a math equation you can th that is center aligned, you can put two dollar signs around it and then write something like um, e to the minus i 
uh, plus one equals zero, I think. And here is, I think this is Euler's formula. So I'll also show you how to embed a link. So if you go over here and type Euler's formula, uh, you can go to Wikipedia. And oh, it's e to the i pi. I pi. I pi, yes. So we'll copy this link and go back to our Jupyter Notebook. Um, e to the i pi. Uh, it's funny how I only partially remember this formula. There it is, plus one equals zero. You want Euler's identity. So that's an example of both typing, uh, typesetting maths as well as embedded a link. Uh, and actually, you can type if you know LaTeX and you're used to using um, things like align blocks and equation blocks and all this other stuff with um, formatting maths. You can pretty much type quite arbitrary, um, you know, mathematical LaTeX uh, into these. Um, uh, into these markdown cells, and they will be uh, they will render as expected. If you really want to get into it, you can actually customize your Jupyter notebooks so that they will allow you to typeset kind of whatever you want with respect to LaTeX in them as well. So, okay, let me set my timer for the exercises. So, if you want, and just take a look at these other exercises for the next few minutes, have a play around with with using Python as a calculator, that kind of thing. And I will check the chat for questions. Um, so Fatima has a question about upgrading Google Colab to Colab Pro. Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Um, I would assume so. I would assume that you should be able to do that here inside of radio without any trouble. Um, but I don't know. Any, any questions about kind of the basic mechanics of using Jupyter Notebooks um, or opening Python scripts, Python consoles, things like this? So Sama says the interface resembles a MATLAB interface. So yes, so actually the origin, um, I don't know, myth, legend uh, of uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, was that they were created to mimic um, Mathematica notebooks, actually, because the original creators, uh, Fernando Perez and Brian Granger and others who started the IPython project, from which all of um, Jupiter kind of uh, emerged, was um, they were physicists who were um, in grad school who were wanted to have kind of an open source alternative to Mathematica um, for doing their work. And so since then, there's been a lot of uh, kind of cross pollination in terms of interface design. So Jupyter notebooks have been in incredibly influential, um, not only on the open source community, but also on the proprietary um, um, proprietary uh, notebook interfaces. So all of the major cloud providers have notebook interfaces that are built on top of JupyterLab. Um, uh, Google's CoLab, for example, is a port of JupyterLab that extends it with some extra features that they have not contributed back to the community. Um, but Amazon has one, Azure has one. Um, um, MATLAB and Mathematica have um, adopted um, a lot of the features of Jupyter Notebooks because they've become so popular. So Hassam has a question, can Jupyter Notebook um, uh, be installed and run without internet uh, on Ubuntu? Absolutely. So, um, well, so 
to install the software, you're going to need an internet connection because you'll need to um, download all the packages and things like that and build your Conda environment like we talked about last week. But once you've downloaded the packages and built your Conda environment that includes JupyterLab, when you launch the JupyterLab server, as discussed at the very beginning of this episode here, and when you activate your environment and you type Jupyter space lab and hit enter, that is going to uh, run Jupyter lab in a browser on your, on your computer. It's not going to require an internet connection. It's just using the browser because um, web browsers are so ubiquitous now that everyone is used to working with them. And so it's a very comfortable environment for most people. How can we, so there's a question about how can we switch a markdown cell to a normal cell? Good question. Uh, so I covered how to go. So there are, um, there are two ways that you can do that. Um, so, so here is, so this is a normal or code cell. And I can hit shift and enter and evaluate that, but it doesn't do anything. So if I wanted to turn this into a markdown cell, I could either go up here and do um, uh, markdown, and that turns it into a markdown cell. Now, if I wanted to convert this back to a code cell, I could either go up here and change this back to code, and that changes it to a code cell, um, or, um, I could, uh, let's do escape and M to change that to a markdown cell. I could hit escape and C, I think. Um, and, M. and now I've forgotten. You can tell that I go from code cells to markdown cells quite a lot, but not not often the other way. I've forgotten the um, um, the keyboard shortcuts. So, uh, nope. Hmm. Well, I've forgotten the keyboard shortcut for how to switch back from uh, Markdown. Uh, to code, but you can definitely do it by using this toggle menu here. Okay. Um, right. So let's see what's going on in chat before we move on to the next episode. Oh, thank you, Mohammed. Mohammed says it's Y. So let's see. So escape M is markdown and then escape why is code cell? So it's why. Thank you. Um, and there's probably a very good reason for that. Um, so if you want to switch from a code cell to a markdown cell with the keyboard shortcuts, again, you can do escape and M. And then to go back from a markdown cell to a code cell, you can do escape and Y. There you go. OK. Let us move on to the next. Uh, the, the next episode. Okay, so variables and assignment. So we're going to quickly move through uh, variables and assignment. So I will just, now that I, I will start using uh, variables and assignment. Okay. So we're going to talk about how you store data in your program. So we're going to see how to assign scalar values to variables and perform calculations and things like this. So the, the basic idea is that you can create a variable um, by, you know, say like age, and you can assign a value to it, say 42. Yeah. And if you hit enter, you can, again, text set, or these code cells are multi-line, so you can make, um, you have multiple lines of Python code in a cell, 
So you can do first name, you know, Ahmed. And so these are two variables. The variables are on the left-hand side, age and first name, the values you're assigned to them on the right-hand side, 42, and the integer 42 and the string Ahmed. Okay. So you can use these variables that you've created um, across cells. So I defined these variables here, but if I have another cell and I do something like, um, uh, first name is age years old. So I can reference these variables in other cells. Yeah. And so Python basically substitutes the value for this variable and um, the value Ahmed, or sorry, the value Ahmed for this variable and the value uh, 42 for this variable and um, substitutes them in and then runs this print function and prints the, the result. Okay. Um, variables have to be defined before you can use them. So if I try to do something like this, um, try to print this variable last name, um, then you'll get a this red underscore under there. And if you put your cursor there, it tells you that, oh, this is an undefined name. So that's telling you that there's going to be an issue with this code. But if you were to try to evaluate this code, you get an error. And that basically says this variable has not been defined. So we haven't given last name a value. So uh, if we were to go up here and then write last name equals uh, Smith and then evaluate this code, now it will evaluate because we've given the um, a value to this last name variable. OK. Um, so you can use variables in calculations. So if we wanted to increment the value of age by 3, we could set age equal to age plus 3, and then print um, Ahmed um, has uh, grown his new age is age. And so we have added three to the value of age and then reassigned that value to the same variable and then uh, use that variable as an argument in the print function. OK. Um, what else? So you can, if you have a, a string, so this is our first kind of discussion of slicing um, and uh, accessing in Python. So if you have a string uh, like, um, it's another atom besides helium, so radon, um, and then you want to get the first letter in that string then you can use square brackets and then uh, zero. So Python is zero indexed, much like um, um, MATLAB, I think. R is index, indexing starts at one, um, but Python indexing starts at zero. That's very important. So if we do the atom name of, with square brackets and zero, that's going to pull out the first uh, letter in this string basically. And strings can be what are called sliced uh, in Python or subset. So if you wanted to get the first three uh, letters in atom name, then you could go from zero and a colon. And then the way it works, it goes start up to, but not including the stop. So if we want to get um, the first three letters, that's the zero, first, and second letter. We need to go zero up to, but not including three. And that gives you rad, okay. Um, there's some other built-in functions like uh, length uh, to get the, the length of things. So if we wanna get the length of the um, atom name, uh, then you can do that. Um, use meaningful variable names. 
Um, don't avoid, you know, using like writing code that is like mathematical notation where you use like X, Y, and Z as variable names. Like use um, use sensible variable names or that are use. Sorry, sensible is a bad word. So use. Um, it's not what I meant. So use variable names that have context within the program that you're writing. So, you know, there's a, an exercise here about um, a calculation involving um, um, converting time. So this total seconds is equal to minutes times 60 plus seconds is much more, is much better than TS equals N times 60 plus S. So the this last way of choosing a name provides you a lot more context about what that calculation is representing. Whereas in this, this, you know, this M and S could be anything. Um, it's not, not necessarily obvious um, what they are. Okay. So take, um, take a few minutes. It will set timer for five minutes. Um, this also be a good time if anybody needs um, a bio break uh, to just take a quick break. Um, and uh, we'll come back in, in five minutes and I'll keep, I'll pick up with the next, uh, the next episode. So just have a look through these exercises um, and see how you get on. And then I'll be back uh, in a couple of minutes. So I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. And um, I also pause the recording. Okay, I'm back. Um, that short, uh, short break. So, um, still about three minutes left for the, the exercises. For those of you who are working through the exercises, um, I'm just going to take a look in the chat. Um, so yes, again, so just as a reminder for, for people who might be joining later, um, the, the session is being recorded and it will be made available um, tomorrow via our YouTube channel. Um, you'll get a link to the YouTube channel um, from uh, via email, uh, probably also tomorrow after I've posted the, uh, after I've posted the link. So I know I might be going a little bit quickly. Uh, it's because I want to, I want to cover as much material as possible. Um, so you can ask me as many questions as possible whilst I'm here. Um, and then if you do need to review the session, it will be available on YouTube. Any other questions while we're just kind of working through these exercises? May I ask a question rather than writing it? Yes, please, please. Uh, yeah. So, what if we use negative indices rather than using positive? That's a great question. Example, like minus one to minus two, how it will access the array? Okay. Uh, best thing to do is to try it out and see. So, Python supports negative ind indexing. Um, so, for example, if you want to access the last um, the last uh, character in this string, or as we'll see later when we work with lists and, and things like that and arrays, the last element in a list or an array, then you can access it using minus one. So that pulls out the n. Now you can do uh, negative indexing and go backwards um, by um, if you were to do minus three to minus one. So now remember how slicing works. So it starts, it includes the start, but not up to, but not including the stop. So if you start with minus one here, then minus two is O, minus three is D. So that's why you get the D. And then it goes from minus three to minus two to minus one, but not including minus one. So then you get the D O. If you wanted to go from, um, say like the last uh, three, uh, three letters in the string, you could do minus three and then just a colon and leave it blank. And that will go from minus three all the way to the end. 
And actually, similarly, you can do that um, from the front as well. If you want to go from the beginning up to you know the third letter, say, you can just leave off the beginning and it kind of fills in the zero here. OK, does that answer your question, Mona? Okay, I will assume that that answered your question. Okay, cool. So my timer just went off. So unless there are any more questions about uh, any of these exercises, I, I would like to move on. Um, the solutions to these exercises, you can get them by clicking on this little down arrow. So if you feel like there's an exercise that um, you don't quite understand, but you're a bit too shy to ask a question about, then you can just click the, uh, the solution to find out what the, uh, the correct answer is. Okay. Just quick. Okay, great, moving along. Okay, data types and data conversion. So this is actually um, an episode that I'm going to skip. Um, so it talks about uh, integers, floats, and strings. I'll introduce those as we start using them uh, in the, the following episodes. Um, and it goes into some detail about the different types and how type controls the operations that you can perform on, uh, on uh, values. So you, know, you can add two integers or two floats together. Or you can add strings, but it acts like string concatenation and things like this. So I'm going to leave this as kind of a, an episode uh, as homework for, for you guys, uh, but I'm not going to cover it in detail here. OK, built-in functions and help. So this one I, uh, I do want to cover. So uh, built-in functions and help. It's short, but it's important for you to know how to get help. OK. Um, so comments, so I guess one of the things that I, I want, so this episode is about showing you how to access um, some basic built-in functions like print and lin and some others that we are going to introduce and how to find out what they do. So basically about accessing various help menus, okay? So um, the, some of the way that you might actually help yourself um, in the future is by leaving comments about your code. So and documenting kind of what your code does. So the hash symbol is, uh, so this is a comment and will be ignored by the Python uh, and interpreter, interpreter. And then, uh, so this is an inline comment and will also be ignored. So there's, there's two ways that you can do comments. You can kind of do comments like as a block, um, or you can put them kind of in line and they'll just be ignored. Okay. So functions, uh, functions can take zero or more arguments. Um, so some functions that, um, that we've seen so far would be, uh, so print. So print, uh, this is an, argument to the print function. Uh, print also takes no arguments and also um, takes more than one argument. I can even use a comment. So takes zero arguments. So print without any arguments just prints a uh, prints a blank line. Um, and print with more than one argument kind of concatenates them together into a single string, but adds spaces in between. OK. You might wonder, well, how can I um, find out how that print behaves that way. And we'll see this in a minute. But if you put a question mark after um, print and evaluate that cell, 
it gives you what's called the doc string, which is the basic documentation about the function and how it works, including what the um, what's called the function signature, which is this part here. Um, and then a description of what the function does, followed by a description of um, the different inputs to the function. Um, and it tells you here that the default separator is a space. So if we were to um, pass in the separator argument and define the separator as a, um, I don't know what would be kind of silly. So as the, uh, as a dollar sign, then we can, we get that behavior. So all functions return something, even even something like print, which seems like um, it seem, print seems like it both returns something, but maybe it doesn't return something. Um, so print um, has what's called side effect in that it takes in arguments and then prints output to what's called the standard out. And in Python or in Jupyter notebooks, the standard out is basically what shows up in these output cells here. Um, but every argument returns something. So, or every function, sorry, returns something. So if you do print, even without, um, so this uh, returns something, even if you pass no arguments. And you might say, well, what is this result? So, here on the right hand side, we call this print function, which returns a value, which then gets assigned to this variable result. So when we try to execute this, we don't get an error. It actually, it, it executes without an error, but it doesn't seem to return anything. So there's a function that was talked about in the, um, called type. Um, and if you look at type, uh, type basically just returns the, the type of a variable. Uh, or an object. And so if you ask for the type of result, it's a none type, which is just the special type that is returned by functions that don't return a regular type. So all functions return a type, might be the none type in something like, in case of something like the print function, but all functions return something. So there's other functions like um, um, min, max, and round. Um, so, you know, you could take the max of a bunch of, a bunch of integers. Um, and you can see here that actually um, some help menus are, are kind of toggling and popping up as I start to use, uh, as I start to use these, uh, uh, these functions. So that's another way that you can, you can get help. So that gives you nine. Um, if we were to uh, the min of this, that would give you one. Um, min and max work on not just numbers, but if you were to um, if you were to put anything that can be ordered, so like you know letters can be sorted out alpha ordered alphabetically. So if you were to put characters in here, um, you would get. Um, you would get an answer from min or max. So anything, any any type that can be uh, ordered, you can uh, you can pass into the max or min functions, things like this. Um, so functions might work for only certain combinations of arguments. So if you were to try to do uh, the max of one and um, the letter a. Then you're going to get a type error because even though you can take like say the max of you know one and two or the max of um, a and z python doesn't know how to compare an integer with a string it can compare integers with integers and strings with strings but it can't compare integers and strings. There's no obvious way that that result should, should return. So 
Um, if you wanted to get this to work, you would have to do something like either use the string function to convert this integer to a string so that they can be compared, um, or um, use the integer function to convert the string to an integer, which, well, actually, this won't work. Um, but if this was a three, then you could do that. So again, the, the takeaways are not so, are more just getting you familiar with the syn using some built-in functions, the syntax of, of functions and arguments, and just this idea that, you know, sometimes some functions have certain kinds of arguments that they'll accept, and sometimes um, they have other kinds of arguments that they won't accept. Um, right. Let me check the chat. There's some questions in here, I think. So yeah, so I mentioned there's a couple ways to, um, I mentioned one way to get help. So if you wanted to know how this max function behaves, if you use the question mark and shift and enter, you'll get the doc string as an output, but you can also do max. Um, and then if you just put the parentheses, then you'll get this pop-up, um, this pop-up menu, which explains kind of what's going on with the different arguments and things like that. And the doc is basically displaying the doc string, but in this little pop-up dialog. And as soon as you start typing, moving your cursor, it will go away. And uh, if you want the top, if you want to manually make that pop-up menu come up, you can hit, you can put your cursor in between the parentheses and then hit shift and tab. And that will bring up uh, the doc string as well. So that's another way. So the, the this is, okay but then it notice as soon as you start typing something it goes away so if i do shift and tab and then i was like okay right so i want to read this doc string as i'm typing out these arguments to make sure that i get the arguments correct as soon as you start typing it goes away so what i will often do is if i have a complicated function that i'm trying to get right i will um hit escape and above or escape an A to create an empty cell above. And then um, I'll do like this. I'll put the, the function that I'm writing in a question mark and then evaluate the doc string. And so now this doc string is here. And so now I can go in here and I can say, okay, well, I can either put uh, something called an iterable, uh, which could be like a list or an array or anything you can kind of iterate over, or I can put a bunch of arguments separated by commas. And so um, I'll put a bunch of things separated by commas and that looks okay. And then, okay, right now I've got an answer. My function is behaving properly. And then if I wanna clean up my notebook, I could go back and hit escape and X and delete that cell, something like this is how I might work. And I'll just do escape and Z to undelete that cell. Okay. Um, so functions attached to something called objects um, are called methods. So um, let's give an example of that. So if you wanted to have uh, some string So we have this sum string, and if you use the type of this sum string, you'll get an error because you've made a typo. Then you know that it's a string. So the type is string. The variable substring, sum string is uh, an example of an object of type string. And so string objects have um, certain kinds of functions that will operate on them. And when you have a function that is operating on an object, it's just called a method. So if you put a dot and then hit tab, then you can get all of the methods or the functions that operate on the object of type string. And you can kind of go through here and find um, all of these and look at all of them. And notice that um, you're getting kind of the doc string over on the right hand side. Um, so let's 
uh, let's look at swap case. So when you're calling a function with um, that is a method that you're accessing using this uh, dot notation, then you usually have um, open and close parentheses. And if there takes arguments, you might put some arguments in here. But this takes no arguments, which we can see by looking at the signature takes no arguments. So this is going to convert uppercase characters, lowercase characters, and vice versa. So then we get a string that looks like this. Okay. Um, so there are other ways to get help. So there's a built-in function actually called help, which you can call, you can pass a function as an argument to the help function and get um, the doc string that way, um, or maybe some more uh, some more help that way. I tend to not use that really much at all. Um, I, I use either the um, the question mark, or I would use the shift and tab uh, approach. Um, Okay. Okay, so there, there are two kinds of errors. So um, one error is called a syntax error. So syntax errors are when basically the Python can't understand what you're trying to do. It doesn't understand the, uh, the program that you've written. So, um, you know, Python has a particular syntax that, you, that we're, you're trying to learn today. Um, about how to write valid Python programs. And if you've written invalid Python, then the Python interpreter is very strict. It only understands Python. So if you've written something in Python that's not quite right, and it's not valid syntactically in Python, then the Python interpreter will just say, oh, I don't know how to understand this. And it'll throw a syntax error. Um, so examples of um, uh, syntax errors, are, um, you know, there's some here in the teaching notes. So there's an example of a syntax error that you get if you forget to close your um, parenthesis, or not your parenthesis, your, um, your quotes, single quotes or double quotes. Um, white space in between an assignment. So, um, so, so this would, could either be two kinds of syntax errors. So it could be uh, you've got an extra equal sign in here. Um, because you were actually trying to just assign age the new value of 52. Or that could have been a typo in that you were actually trying to do uh, a test of whether the value assigned to the age variable is 52, in which case you might have had an extra white space. Yeah. Um, Forgetting to close your parentheses or brackets used to be a favorite kind of syntax error, um, but that tends to not happen so much anymore um, because, uh, as you'll notice, um, Python um, tends to auto-complete brackets for you. So you know I can just keep doing this, and it's going to be very hard, even if I make a bunch of nested brackets, it's auto-completing the brackets for you. Um, and so it's very hard to make that kind of uh, uh, that kind of an error. Although this will give you uh, a different syntax error in that it will print um, it will try to print uh, an empty uh, a print with no arguments, but then it doesn't. This this syntax doesn't make sense, so it just throws an error at the first square bracket. So it's a different kind of a syntax error. But you could see that it auto-completed all of your, your various kinds of brackets. So you're very unlikely to make this kind of syntax error. OK. The other kind of error is a runtime error. So runtime errors are errors are, are a bit more nefarious in that um, you know, runtime errors can crop up you know, hours into a calculation or days into a calculation if you're doing something that's really long running. Um, so this would be valid, uh, syntactically valid Python code. So 
So this is syntactically valid, um, but it will throw a runtime error. And the reason is that obviously this is just a typo, but Python doesn't know that this is a typo. It just assumes that there's going to be some variable called AEG that is defined somewhere else in your program. So from a syntax perspective, this is perfectly acceptable. It generates a runtime error though. Um, and so to fix that, obviously in this case, we would want to do that. Um, so take a couple of minutes um, and have a look at these exercises at the end of this uh, at the end of this episode and see how you get on. Um, this one is uh, usually causes several people to to trip up. So I'd have you if you just want to look at one one particular exercise, check out check out spot the difference, see how you get on with that one. Um, I'll set my my timer and then. I'll see if anyone has questions in the chat. So I'm just going to briefly stop sharing. OK. So for the next three minutes, you're going to have, uh, have a look at some of those exercises and then um, ask any questions you want um, in the chat or otherwise. And, uh, and then we'll move on. Any questions? Since you guys are so quiet, you must be working through your exercises very studiously. Okay, so just a, a little bit left to a um, little bit of time left to work on those exercises. Okay, so. I'll share my screen again. Um, so I'm going to go through this one exercise, spot the difference, uh, and then we'll move on uh, just to kind of make sure that, um, so this is the uh, spot the difference. Okay, so we have uh, an easy string which we call ABC. And then we want to print the max value of easy string. 
So we would guess that this easy string, the max value is going to be C. Indeed. So, but then we're going to have a couple other strings. So rich gold and uh, poor is 10. And then we want to print the max of rich and poor. Okay. Now, the question is, what is this going to print? And the answer is 10. And you might think, well, why, what is happening here? So what happens is that, um, so max, the max function is going to compare the values assigned to the variables rich and poor. So what will happen is that, if I go down here, so first the val the string that is the string that is assigned to the variable rich will be substituted in here for the rich variable, and then the string that is assigned to the uh, variable poor will be substituted in here. And so Max will compare the string G O L D with the string T I N, and it will start by comparing the characters um, in these strings. That's how you compare strings. You kind of line them up and you compare them uh, letter by letter. And so since T is greater than G, then 10 must be greater than gold, and therefore 10 is what gets printed. Now, what will happen if we change the T to a G? So compare gold and gin, which of these is going to be greater? So this time it's going to compare the G and the G. So that's the same. So then it's going to move on to the second letter and compare the O and the I. So this ought to print gold because O is greater in the sense that it comes after in an alphabetical ordering of the letter I. Okay. Okay, so moving on to the next, uh, the next episode. Morning coffee. So this would normally be the mid-morning break uh, in a full day um, uh, in a full day workshop. So we're going to move right by that and talk about libraries. So I will add uh, libraries. Okay. So. Um, Using libraries is really important, uh, in part because you know the, there's the Python language, and then there is the Python standard libraries, which include libraries that are prepackaged with Python. And then there's a huge community of um, of libraries in the Python ecosystem, which is what makes Python um, um, such a popular programming language. Um, so Salma is saying they can't seem to find the binder page you uh, you are looking for. If by that you mean uh, these links here, so the Calc Binder Hub and the Public Binder Hub. So I will copy that and post it into the chat. Uh, so, if that is what you're looking for. Okay. Hopefully that will sort you out. Okay, so um, if you want to use libraries, you need to import them before that you can use them. So, for example, if we want to use the math library, we need to import the math library. And once we've imported it, then we can use it. So we can import it and then we can say uh, pi is and then math dot um, pi. And you can see the help menus are kind of uh, toggling. And so we can see that this is going to convert a string or a number to, uh, or wait, that's pi. There we go. 
And so that gives you pi is 3.14159, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can also access, um, actually, I'll just leave off the print statement. Um, so if you want, so if you're wondering why you can leave off the print statements and then, you know, like here, I don't have a print statement here, but it prints out 47 as the output. That's, um, that's something that happens in notebooks or IPython consoles. But if you want a value to be printed out when you run a script, then you need to use the print function. Um, so, but here in notebooks and in consoles, you can get by without it. So you can look at what is the math. Um, so if we were to use the, the cosine function of math.pi, and if you remember your, uh, your trigonometry, so pi is 180 degrees and cosine is kind of the x axis and sine is the y axis. So cosine of pi should be minus one. Um, and then math.sine should be uh, of math of pi should be zero. And that's as close to zero as you can get given the numerical precision of the computer that you're on. Um, and then if we wanted to do other things, we could compare, um, so for example, math.tangent of math.pi and math. Dot, now I'm really having to dig back to my my trigonometry divided by math cosine of math pi da, da, and so two different ways of, of calculating the tangent and we arrive at the same answer. That's good. Um, so you can pass libraries um, into the help module. I almost never do this. Um, and this just basically gives you the, the help menu. Um, I typically use this kind of dot notation. So I hit, I type math dot, and then this allows me to have access to basically all of the information that's in that help um, string. But I can just kind of toggle through here and um, you know find whatever it is I'm looking for, basically. And of course, if I know that it starts with an F, I can type F and then this will limit me to only the things that have an F and then that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, typing math.this and math.that is a bit annoying. So if you know that you're only going to use um, certain kind or certain functions from a, a package, then you can do from math import the things that you're actually going to use. So cosine or pi. Uh, so cosine, pi, sine, tangent, for example. And then I could do uh, the cosine of pi, uh, or sorry, I could, I could write this, this same expression here much more succinctly as the tangent of pi and um, the cosine, or sorry, the sine of pi over the cosine of pi. And whoop. David, uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, for the command line number 53, uh, we know that sine by equals zero. Yes. Although here the number shows very, very small number, yes, but it should be exactly zero. So what, what, what's, I mean, Right. So this math library is not a symbolic math library. So there is a symbolic math library called SymPy. Um, I don't think I installed it in uh, um, in this environment. Yeah. So I did not install. So this is the error that you would get if you tried to import a module that you haven't installed. Um, but there is a symbolic math um, library called SymPy. And it's really, really awesome. Does a whole lot of, uh, it basically is like um, um, 
a lot of what Mathematica does, not everything that Mathematica does um, or, or Maple or other symbolic mathematics libraries, but um, it does a lot of the basic stuff, like symbolic derivatives and integrals and things like this. Um, so there they have um, ways of doing kind of um, exact calculations um, where things are exact. But in this case, um, we're doing, uh, we're using a mathematical um, or numerical um, implementations of these functions. And so the precision with which you can represent things like um, zero, so is, um, is limited by the precision of the computer, of the floating point arithmetic on which your computer is happening. So that's why you're getting these numbers here. And it, interestingly, even note here that, um, so here we have a representation of zero um, that is um, very, very close to zero, but still positive technically. And here, so the tangent of pi is also zero. Yeah. But here you have something that is very, very, very close to pi or very, very close to zero, but actually negative. So, um, you know, the usual yeah. caveats with uh, numerical precision and doing, you know, uh, numerical computation on a computer definitely apply um, when you're doing uh, when you're using Python. So um, I didn't care about tan because the error will be compounded, uh, as you know, tan x sine over cosine. So of the basic, uh, uh, I mean, if, the, if sine uh, by is not zero, then definitely tan will be not uh, accurate. Yeah. Um, Okay, so da, 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 where was I? Um, right, okay. Uh, but typically, uh, typically, you, although you can do these kinds of import statements, you don't, um, you typically don't. And the reason is that, um, let's suppose that you had something already defined, like a variable or a function that you had written that had, was called cosine or sine or tangent. Then when you import specific things like this, it would overwrite, um, it would overwrite um, those, those things that were already available in memory. And so what I mean by that was suppose that you did, okay, suppose that I had gone up here and I had said tan and I had called it a string um, is a color. Um, and okay, so now here, I have tangent or I have tan, which is a variable that I've defined, which is assigned the value string as a color. If I now come down here and import something with the same name, a function, now I get the function result. So this, this tan as a variable is gone. And so now if I do tan, it tells me that this is a function from the math library. So it's overwritten this variable here. And so this is called clobbering. And this can happen quite frequently when you import specific items from packages. Um, this example is a bit contrived, but it can definitely happen. Um, so what I would recommend and what you often see in, um, in Python code in the wild that you might encounter from a Google search or if you look through GitHub um, and various open source libraries is importing with an alias. So instead of math, you might say import math as m, for example. And then we can use m dot cosine of m dot pi and get minus one, or m dot sine of m dot pi, yeah, things like this. So this is typically how um, we will, I will import things. Okay. Um, so there are some exercises here. So let's take, um, just take a couple of minutes. Uh, so I'll set the timer for three minutes. Um, maybe have a look at this jigsaw puzzle. Um, it's an example of something that's called a Parsons problem. So um, you've got some code that's almost complete, but not quite. And it's a bit scrambled in that the rows are out of order. So see if you can rearrange the, the rows of code here 
and then fill in the blanks to print out um, so print out the result, which in this case will be randomly selecting a character from this string. And we'll go over that. Uh, we'll go over that together. Okay. Ah, so Muna asks, so how to add SimPy to the environment? So that's a that's a good question, um, Muna. Um, one of the things that you could do is um, is uh, you could use something called, let's see if this is in here. Um, so there's a magic, an IPython magic command. Uh, let me check if this works first. So there's an IPython magic command for conda and pip, um, which you can use to install things. So if I wanted to install um, SimPy into the, um, into the environment in which this notebook is running. So that's what's meant by the current kernel. Uh, then I should be able to do this. And then this, of course, is going to go through the whole condo routine. So it's going to have to check and make sure that there's no um, issues with uh, dependencies. And for some reason, it's uh, it's noted some potential problems, but I think we can ignore those. And then um, it's downloading and installing uh, SimPy plus some other stuff that SimPy needs. Now, let's see if I can import SimPy. Yeah, so now I can import SimPy. And so inside of SimPy, um, there are, I have to wait for a minute for my, uh, my tab completion to catch, to catch up. But I think, uh, or maybe I would import SimPy as SP. That's usually how I would import SimPy. And then I think SimPy has its own uh, uh, representation of pi and its own uh, cosine function. Yeah, so we can do cosine of SimPy.pi. And then if we wanted to do cosine of sine of pi, now we get exactly zero. Yeah. Now, the other way that you would add the, normally I wouldn't do, uh, this is kind of, um, I'll put a little comment here. So uh, only do this when you are prototyping. Okay, it's much better to, um, put this in, uh, I mean, what I mean by prototyping is you're just kind of like playing around, trying to hack something together, kind of like what we're doing here. We're playing around, we're learning. Um, if I, if this was a production environment for like a project that I had, what I would do is I would probably stop the, stop the notebook and shut down JupyterLab, um, go back and add uh, SimPy in here as a dependency and then rebuild the environment and then relaunch JupyterLab. Yeah. Um, that way, uh, because if I, if I don't do that, then I have a habit of forgetting something like if I install a bunch of stuff inside my, um, my notebooks, then I have a habit of kind of forgetting what, what I've actually installed. And then if I was to go back and create this environment and I hadn't remembered to put these dependencies in here, then I would get in an inconsistent environment again. Like I would lose the, um, 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 I would lose the, uh, the fact that I had installed these things in the notebook. So I tend to update here. Uh, 
Um, right, okay. Cool, so let's, um, that was a great question. Well, let's see if we have two more questions. And, so uh, what is the use of the notebook? I mean, who will use the notebook usually for programming or something like that? So the notebook, so the notebooks are incredibly popular and they're used for, um, for everything from kind of an interactive lab notebook. So that's how most of our users here at Calston and most of the places that I have worked um, as a uh, doing machine learning or data science, notebooks are the way that we kind of record what we're doing in a way that we can share it easily with others. That's the key use case for the notebook. If you are developing kind of production, like machine learning pipelines, like if I'm gonna run a Python job on, um, uh, on IBEX that's gonna run for quite a long time, maybe doing deep learning training or some other machine learning kind of uh, model with scikit-learn, then I'm gonna write that in a Python script because a Python script can be launched as a batch job. I can just launch it on a cluster or on a cloud server and let it run until it's finished. Whereas an interactive notebook is interactive. So you launch a notebook server and we're here doing things interactively. So it's a kind of an environment for, for playing around, for experimenting, for sharing your, your work with others. But if you are going to you know, write some, you know, I'll call it production code that is going to run repeatedly on remote servers and needs to be um, you know, optimized for that use case, then you want to write that in a script. So um, how to use it under uh, on HPC? So that's a great question. It's a little bit out of, uh, out of scope for today. Um, on our YouTube channel, I will be putting some, um, some videos on how to launch uh, Jupyter Notebooks on our uh, HPC infrastructure here at Kaos on IBEX and on um, possibly on Shaheen. Um, so you can, uh, you can do that, um, but it's kind of, not really the way that those environments are designed to work, where they're, they're more focused on uh, batch jobs and writing scripts and launching scripts, but you can do it. Okay. Okay, good questions. So I just wanna do this um, uh, quickly, this Parsons problem, because it's a good, so I'm just gonna kind of copy it. And so this is the, uh, Jigsaw puzzle exercise. Okay, so um, basically we want to rearrange this and get some working code out of it. So the first thing that we want to do is move the import statements to the top. So usually you're going to put your import statements at the very top of your um, of your script or maybe of your notebook. It's quite common, for example, for all of the import statements for packages or libraries used in a notebook to be at the very top of the notebook in the first cell. That's kind of a convention, but you can obviously put them anywhere. Um, and so then we're gonna define this variable basis, and then I'm just gonna comment out the rest of this stuff. Okay, so that works. Okay, so now we've defined our, our basis variable. And then um, what we wanna do is randomly select um, a base, um, from this string. So we need to, to do that. We need to um, you know, maybe randomly generate some integers between zero, which would select A, and the length of this string, which would then select out um, the, the last character here. Basically. So we can do that. There is a random package. Um, so if we were to look at random and then rand range and maybe shift and tab. So random, uh, so choose a random item from a range, uh, stop and or start to stop and does not include uh, the endpoint. So this behaves just like the kind of slicing that we want. So we can do a range from zero up to so up to but not including something. Okay. Um, and actually, here we're supposed to call this thing n basis. Okay. 
So n bases is probably short for the number of bases. So we can get rid of that. Now, n bases, we know we need to define it before we use it. And we can actually get the number of bases by just assigning that to be the length of our basis string. And then um, we need to assign the output of the random range to some variable. I'll call that random index. And then here we can replace this with uh, random index and this with random index. Okay. And that extra space there is not needed. So if we keep running this, so now we are going to continually randomly choose an integer and therefore choose a base. You might wonder, well, what if I didn't want it to be truly random? What if I want it to be random, but I wanted to start it from a particular seed? Well, there's probably in the random library um, some kind of function for setting a seed. Random.set. There it is, random.seed. And initialize internal state from a seed. And so you can put an integer in here. So I will put 42. And now that I'm setting this seed, I'm going to get the answer every, the same answer every time. And if we were to comment this out, we'll go back to getting different uh, random and uh, random bases. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions before I move on to the next episode? Okay. All right. So now we're going to do some data analysis. So we've talked about libraries and now we're going to talk about a library for uh, doing data analysis and that's pandas. Um, and I'll just go over here and pandas Python. It's always good to put pandas in Python rather than just pandas because otherwise you'll end up with the animals as opposed to the Python library. So here is the the web page for the pandas library. Um, there's a great book uh, by the the creator of the pandas uh, uh, library, um, Wes McKinney, um, called Python for Data Analysis. It's, it's in its second edition. Um, and you can get a PDF, uh, a free version of the PDF here. Um, highly recommend it to do a deep dive into the functionality for pandas, which is the key um, uh, the data analysis library when you're getting started with, with doing machine learning and data analysis in Python. So highly recommend it. Um, that was how I learned pandas was actually going through the first edition of, of his book. So we are going to, uh, so I'm just going to put a markdown cell reading tabular data into data frames. Okay. So we're going to import pandas as PD. So this is the typical alias that you'll see for pandas is we're imported as PD. So we're going to see how to import uh, the pandas library, how to use pandas to load a, a simple um, CSV data set and play around. Okay. Now, one of the um, most important things about reading in your data is knowing where your data lives. So my sandbox um, notebook was created inside the introduction to Python notebooks directory. So here you can see the sandbox notebook. In the introduction to Python directory, there is a data directory, which has all the CSV files. So when we go to load our data using this read CSV file or function, we need to um, provide the path from the current directory where the notebook is running 
which is this notebooks directory, to the file to the CSV file we want to load. Yeah. So fortunately, we'll get some help with that. So we need to go up one directory from notebooks to introduction to Python, down into the data directory, and then in the data directory, we have all of our files here. And I'll just expand this just for a minute so you can see what the file names are. I guess I need to do this. Okay. So here are all the files here. And we want to load the um, gap minder uh, GDP uh, Oceana. And we'll store this in a variable called uh, df for data frame. Oh, file not found. Why is that? I must have a typo somewhere. And uh, oh, let's see, where am I? Notebooks. So up into data gap minder. Aha, I do have a typo. I left off the extension. There we go. So you can run just like in, a, in an IPython console, you can run this PWD command, which is actually a, a Unix command. Um, and it will tell you where you are. So again, this is just me checking that I wasn't somewhere where somewhere else. Um, and then you can pass in uh, the path from where you are to where your CSV file is, and then you can uh, load your data. And now um, we have our data frame. So this data has only two rows and a whole bunch of columns. And the two rows correspond to two countries, and the columns correspond to uh, GDP per capita, which is the amount of economic output per person in the country in a particular year. Uh, okay. And these numbers are, um, are what's called purchasing power parity. If you're, if you're wondering like, what are the units of these? Um, because the, uh, the value of um, money changes across time with inflation or deflation. And um, it changes across countries in a different point in time. So like if you take a one US dollar in the United States can purchase much less than one US dollar in Bangladesh, for example. Um, and, and even in countries like Australia and New Zealand, which are you know, relatively similar in many respects, a US dollar in Australia, when converted to Australian currency versus a US dollar in New Zealand converted to New Zealand currency, different purchasing powers, um, in those countries. And then of course, the purchasing power changes across time. So these numbers are adjusted to account for those differences. So we can make these kind of cross time and cross country comparisons when we start comparing things. Okay. Um, right. So this data for many CSV files have a column, which is like the natural um, index. So zero and one are the indexes that are created for the rows in the CSV file, but actually our rows are uniquely determined by the country column. So we can just put uh, in index call equals um, country. And now we get a data frame where it's indexed by country. And so this is useful because in pandas, you can index things by labels. So you can put in like Australia, New Zealand, or GDP per cap underscore 1952 to select out rows or columns of data. We're going to see how to do that in a minute. Now, this read CSV file is one of the first kind of what I'll call it a real world function where um, the function signature is quite complicated and has a lot of options. And learning how to use this read CSV file efficiently um, is one of, the one of the things that 
you know, there's almost a whole chapter in the introduction to Python for data analysis book that Wes McKinney wrote on how to effectively use the uh, read CSV file. It has to handle a lot of cases because CSV files are a very common data format, but each CSV file is slightly different in its own way. It might have a different delimiter. It might use quoting. It might have, you know, bad lines in it. It might have um, um, all kinds of weird things that can go on in CSV files. And this, this function needs to be able to handle as many of those cases as possible. Thus, it's, it's quite involved. Um, we're only going to use a little bit of its functionality today. So Sammy asks, uh, we're getting text files from uh, spectrometers in our lab formatted in a different way. So how could we get these text files converted into a CSV file? So and the answer, which looks like Muhammad is uh, providing partially in the chat right now, is that um, a text file can be read in by this read CSV file. It's probably the case that your text files have a different formatting. So maybe they're using not a comma as a delimiter between the columns, but maybe uh, a tab or a semicolon or uh, a pipe character. Um, uh, these are common uh, delimiters. But as long as there's a consistent delimiter, uh, then you could use the read CSV file to import this, this data. Um, but if you have, um, you know, Sammy, if you're here at KAUST, uh, then you're more than welcome to uh, reach out to me on via email or Slack and with a specific example of that text file. And I can probably set you straight pretty quickly on how to import it with read CSV or if it cannot be imported with read CSV, I could probably tell you that as well. But the chances are, are pretty good that it can probably it can be imported with CSV, read CSV. Okay, so back to our, our data frame. So we can our data frame. You can get some information about the data frame, um, and the data frame will tell you basically you know how many columns and how many rows and how they're indexed. Um, what, what types of data are stored in each column. So all of these columns are numbers, so they're floating point numbers. Um, there are no missing values, so it's very common to have missing values um, in, in tabular data, but in our case, we don't have any missing values. Um, also, it tells you something about the memory usage. Um, so this is, you know, this might be important. So if, you're, if you have a laptop that has eight gigabytes of, of RAM, then you know, the largest CSV file that you're going to be able to read in might be about four gigabytes, um, maybe a little larger, depending on what else is going on in your operating system um, in terms of reading it into a pandas, uh, a pandas data frame. Um, but a lot, actually, a lot of the complexity of the read CSV file is handling the case when the CSV file or files are too big to read into memory at once. And you need to do what's called chunking and only read and process a chunk of your CSV file at a go. That's a more advanced than what we'll cover today, but it's very common uh, uh, use case for read CSV. Um, you can look at the columns of your data frame by accessing the columns, columns um, uh, attribute, which just gives you the, the column names as an index object. Um, data frames are two-dimensional data structures, so you can kind of think of them as a two-dimensional array or matrix and transpose them. So swapping rows for columns. Um, there is a handy describe method that uh, you can use to calculate uh, summary statistics of all of the numerical uh, columns in your data set, in which case is all of our columns here. So that's really handy. Um, OK, so let's take, uh, take a few minutes, so three minutes, and have a look at these exercises. So um, there's some examples of, I'm kind of jumping all over the place here. So 
uh, reading other data files. So definitely be sure that you understand how to read in the data files. That's really important. So make sure that you can read in the other data files. Um, and you know, some of them are larger than others. Like this, this data frame for Oceania only had two countries, but obviously like Asia, Africa will have uh, larger data frames. Um, there's another CSV file that um, is for the whole world that has a slightly different format if you want to explore what that one looks like. Um, uh, there's some exercises here that explore different methods like head and tail um, to figure out what those, uh, what those might do. So take a few minutes and uh, look through those exercises. Um, and then I'll just uh, stop sharing briefly. And you guys can ask me some questions if you have, uh, have any questions. And then we'll move on. So um, I realize it's about so it's about three fifteen. So I believe that uh, prayer time is in like roughly fifteen minutes. Uh, so what I thought we might do is um, I'm going to quickly kind of go through the next episode, uh, which is just a little bit more about pandas data frames, and then uh, and then we'll take a break um, from you know three basically you know. 3.30, 3, maybe like 3.40 for 20 minutes. We'll take a break from 3.40 until uh, 4 o'clock. And then we'll come back and, and at 4 o'clock and do another hour and see how far we get. So hopefully that works for, uh, uh, for everyone. So there's a question in chat from Najat. So why would we want to treat columns as rows using transpose? So, um, We'll see this in a minute, uh, or we'll see one potential use case in a minute. But uh, so data frames have an, actually a plot method where you can just plot them. Um, and so here, if we just call the plot method on uh, on this data frame, we get something that looks really weird. Like we get, like this just doesn't look like what we would expect at all. Like what we really want to plot, um, you know, if we look at our, uh, if we were to look at the df, you know, head command, you know, um, um, we really want to plot the Australia and New Zealand, their GDP per capita across time. So we want to plot, not plot the columns, which is what's happening when you just call df.plot, but we want to plot the rows. So, you know, we could do df.transpose.plot. And then that gives us kind of the plot that we that we probably want. Um, but alternatively, you could say, well, um, maybe we should just reorient this data frame so that actually the countries are the columns, and this what are the columns are the rows, and make that the actual permanent orientation of the data frame. And um, so we could do that. So if you did df uh, equals df dot transpose, now uh, your data frame would look like this. So you can look at the first five and the last five, something like this. Um, I'm actually going to put it back again um, because I want to use it as. Excuse me. Row on share first. your screen. Oh. Sorry, we can't see <laughs> your screen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad that somebody uh, interrupted to remind me. So thank you. So where where was I? So okay. So I changed the orientation of the data frame by just assigning reassigning it to that variable, but calling the transpose method. 
uh, or actually no, before that. So if we plotted the data frame when it's oriented like this, um, rows and columns, it plots the columns by default. And so here we get this like nonsensical graph. But here, if we transpose it and plot it, we get what we want, which is kind of the GDP per capita across time. We're going to do a lot more plotting later, so don't worry too much about this looking a bit ugly. So here, then, I reset it back to, um, uh, or then I transpose it and then reassign it to the variable. And now, if you call head and tail from the exercise that you may have done, head pulls out the first uh, five um, by default. Uh, rows and tail pulls out the last five rows. And so now you can see that the data has changed its orientation. And then I can put it back again by just transposing the transpose. And then now we're back to where we were. So it kind of depends on what, what you what you want to do. Wouldn't it be better if you assign it to you a new variable so you can use either one of them? Uh, yes. So in general, um, we'll see some more examples of this in, in the next episode um, that, um, um, but yes, you're absolutely right. Typically you better off um, not overwriting your variable names like that. So I was just doing that kind of quickly because I was trying to demonstrate um, something in response to a question, but you're absolutely right. Okay, any more questions before we, uh, we move on. Okay. Okay, so moving, moving on. So what I want to do is try to quickly cover the indexing and selecting values from Pandas data frames. And then we're going to take a break for about 20 minutes for prayer. And then hopefully we'll come back um, at um, at 4 p.m. and then we'll carry on for, for another hour. Um, so I've got to get through this in uh, 16 minutes. Okay. Um, so selecting values. So there's two ways that you can select values in, um, in pandas data frames. You can select them by integer location. So like the integer label for the rows or the integer label for the columns, or you can use the actual labels. So now I'm going to read in um, a different data frame. I'll call this uh, Europe data frame. And I'm going to read in from read CSV data uh, Gapminder, Europe, CSV, and the index column is going to be the country. And I must have made a typo again. Yes, I forgot the GDP. Okay. And so if we look at the Europe data frame, the first few rows, it has the same structure as before. So the countries are, are the row labels, and then these GDP per cap in a particular year are the, um, are the column labels. So we can access data by index label, or by um, integer label, sorry, using the iloc method. And instead of uh, parentheses, we actually use square brackets because we're selecting. So we're selecting the zeroth row and the zeroth column and returning the value, which is, in this case, the value for Albania GDP per capita in 1952. Now, I almost never use this, the iLOOC. Instead, I prefer to select data by labels because these integer, um, integer labels, like 0, 1, 2, 3, da, 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 and zero, one, two, three, da, 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 are, um, are uh, arbitrary, right? I mean, there's no, um, there's no reason why these countries have to be ordered in the way that they're ordered. Um, so it makes more sense to use label-based indexing, which is what you get when you use the loc method. 
And here we'll put uh, Albania, which is a country label uh, for the row. And then for the column label, we can put GDP, GDP per cap uh, and say 1952. And oh, variable not defined, Europe data frame, DF. So this using uh, prefer uh, label-based indexing and slicing. So this to me is much more uh, explicit about what data you're selecting. And typically you're selecting a subset of data that you're then gonna use in some calculation. So you want to be able to look at your code and see what you're doing. Whereas this, this tells me nothing about what this value represents. So definitely you should prefer label-based indexing and slicing. Uh, you can use, just like when we were slicing with strings and we we're using a, a colon to represent, um, um, the entire uh, kind of slice or the entire string, we can do that here. So if we wanted to select all the countries at a particular point in time, for cap uh, 1977. So this is selecting all the countries at a particular point in time. So I'll put a little note here select all countries in a particular year. So select date data, all countries in a particular year. And similarly, we could do uh, select data on um, uh, data for all years for a particular country. And uh, so let's do Europe data frame, loc. So a particular country, let's go with uh, Germany uh, and all years. So we'll put a call in there. Okay. So Germany per capita and uh, per GDP per capita in 1952 was only 7,144 uh, US dollars. Um, but that's to be somewhat expected because this is less than five years after the Second World War ended. And uh, then obviously its GDP per capita has gone up by uh, not quite a factor of five since then. Uh, okay. So what else? So uh, we can do multiple, uh, just you can kind of slice, uh, slice up uh, data frames. So for example, if we wanted to go from um, uh, Iceland to uh, Serbia and from uh, GDP per cap 1957 through GDP per cap uh, 2002. So we can use the colon to indicate um, uh, ranges as well. And But remember, unlike the slicing that we did earlier, which went from including start up to but not including stop. Here we it's we do include the stop. So Serbia, for example, is included as is GDP per cap 2002, which makes sense because when we're doing calculations with like lists and arrays and that kind of thing, we um, we usually don't want to in, include the endpoint. But when we're selecting data, it makes sense to include the endpoint. So it. Pandas does kind of the expected thing in this case. Um, right, okay, so you can use uh, the output of slices in, um, in calculations. 
So uh, if we wanted to call this uh, subset data frame, uh, then we can use the subset data frame and we can do things like describe this subset. Um, we can do um, the max and compute the, the max uh, across the rows for each column. Um, what else can we do? So we can create um, uh, conditional statements. Uh, so subset um, data frame is greater than 10,000. So this is going to return a data frame that has the value of true if the GDP per capita for a particular country in a particular year was greater than uh, 10,000 US dollars. So for example, in 1957, Norway had a greater uh, GDP per capita greater than 10,000. So that is true. Whereas other countries like Italy, Ireland, and Iceland did not. And so they have a value that's false. So if we wanted to actually get the values instead of true and false, if we wanted to have the numerical values for which this condition is true and missing numbers otherwise, we can use, um, we can actually assign this to a variable. So we can assign this to uh, a variable called, I don't know, call it is relatively rich. And then we can use the um, subset. And now we can use just square brackets on their own and then select uh, is relatively rich. Or we can use is relatively rich to select the values from subset for which that is true. Uh, oh, not defined, subset data frame. There we go. And so what you can see is wherever this was true, so Netherlands and Norway in 1957, has been replaced with the actual numerical value from the table, or from the data. And then where that value is false, it's just filled in a missing value. And that's sometimes useful because if you wanted to compute um, some descriptive statistics, but you only wanted to include the values of countries that were relatively rich, then you could do something like this. And so you can see here in 1957, we're computing these descriptive statistics only for these two observations here. So that's why the count is two. And then in 1962, we get Iceland. So that adds a third observation. And so now these descriptive statistics are computed over these three observations and so on. And then by the time we get um, to 2002, you know, most of the countries are included. And so we have seven out of the 10 countries. Okay. Um, we're going to end with um, a slightly more involved example of the group by uh, split apply combine uh, paradigm, where, which is a very common way of of doing what's called extract, transform, and load ETL workloads in, in data analysis. So we're going to uh, take the rows in our data set and group them by a particular um, condition. And then once we have grouped our data, our rows into different kind of bins based on some condition, we're going to apply a function to each of those bins, and then we're going to combine the result at the end. So um, for example, if, um, if we started off with our, a question where we wanted, to, um, we wanted to see how we could group up countries in Europe depending on whether they are you know, relatively poor or relatively rich. Yep. So one of the things that we could do is we could say, okay, well, um, 
if we compute the mean, then this is going to compute the average GDP per capita um, across all countries in Europe for each year. Yeah. Now you can see the average GDP per capita across Europe has gone up as you would expect. Um, but if we wanted to say like, well, a country is relatively rich if their GDP per capita is greater than average. So that's what this is saying. So I'm going to call this is relatively rich. Okay. And you know, if we look at this, we can see now this is saying that in 1952, Albania's GDP per capita was lower than average for across all the countries in 1952 in Europe. And so it gets a false. Where a country like the UK was uh, had a GDP per capita that was higher than the average across all European countries in 1952. And so it gets a true. And then you can compute or you can work out true or false for all the other countries in all the other years similarly. Okay. Now, um, what we can do is we can say, okay, well, how many, um, um, what if we take the sum of this data frame? Well, the sum of this data frame, um, actually, maybe I will do this. If we take the sum, so this is going to sum across the columns. And if where you're summing trues and falses, trues and falses are going to be treated as ones and zeros. So you're summing these ones and zeros. What you're really doing is counting the number of countries in Europe for which this is relatively rich condition was true. Yeah. And so you see that there are 13 countries for which that is true in, um, um, in, uh, in 1952 and 17 countries for which that was true um, in uh, 2007. Yeah, but what if we compute the sum not across uh, the first axis or the zeroth axis, which is the row, but if we compute the sum across the axis one, which is the summing across the columns, let's see what we get. Okay, so what we get here is for each country, we get the number of times its GDP per capita was greater than the average of the GDP per capita in Europe in that year. So a country like Albania has never had a GDP per capita that was greater than average. Whereas countries like Austria um, and Belgium, which are, which are intuitively wealthier countries in Europe, do uh, have um, 12 examples of when that was true. So if we were to use uh, instead of a sum, we could compute the mean. And this would basically just normalize these integers by the number of countries that were um, uh, in that year. And so this is doing the same calculation, but slightly different than the way that, um, the way that it's done in the, in the lecture notes. But it arrives at the same result, I think a little bit more cleanly. Um, and we can use these numbers now to group the countries. So we've computed this kind of uh, what they call a wealth score. But we've basically just used a bit of data analysis to compute a metric for which we can group these countries. So countries that have the same wealth score will be grouped together. So Albania will be grouped with Bosnia and Herzegovina and Bulgaria and Croatia, whereas countries like the United Kingdom, um, Sweden, Switzerland, um, Netherlands and Norway, France will be grouped together. Germany, okay. And then what we can do is we can, now we can do this group by, now that we have something to group by, uh, group by key, we can group our data frame
and then compute, I'll compute an average. Uh, oh, group by. And so now what we are, what we are getting here um, is the average GDP per capita in 1952 across all countries whose wealth score was zero. So that's basically including only um, so all these countries that have a zero wealth score, I average them up. This calculation averages their GDP per capita in 1952 and returns a result. And this value takes all the countries who had a wealth score of one and computes their average GDP per capita in 1957. And that turns out to be $10,611. Okay. So there are some exercises here, which I leave um, as kind of exercises for you during the break, if you want to look at them. Um, I am very conscious that I want to allow some uh, a break for prayer time. So we'll take a break now um, and we'll come back in 20 minutes. So just a little bit after four o'clock. Um, and we'll pick up and see how far we can get basically in that last hour um, on just continuing this theme of, of data analysis in Python. Okay, so I'll hang around. I'm going to save and stop sharing my screen. I'll hang around for a minute, uh, just if anybody has some pressing questions. Um, otherwise, I'll pause the recording and uh, take a break myself. So I'll see you at uh, just after four o'clock. Okay, any questions? Last chance before I go on my my break. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, I will see you guys uh, in about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So welcome back everybody. So we've uh, got a little bit of time left. Um, so we're going to get right back into, uh, into the teaching. So I'm going to share my screen again. And um, so here is the Several people have asked about this, so I wanted to share the link to our uh, our YouTube channel. Um, this link will go out tomorrow uh, as well when I posted the video for today, but I'll go ahead and share the link and chat with everybody um, since several people have uh, have asked for it. Um, and we'll get back to now we'll get back to teaching. Okay. So we're going to pick up with the next uh, the next episode on plotting. Okay, um, so plotting is is a very common thing, obviously that people that wants to do with uh, data analysis is plot some results. So we've seen a little bit of plot plotting already. Um, so the standard plotting library in Python is um, matplotplotlib. Uh, and the standard import is to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt for plot. Now the lecture notes has this kind of uh, matplotlib inline command, which is, isn't necessary um, any longer. So you don't need to worry about that. So if we wanted to use the a simple plot, we could do something like we could create, um, uh, these are called Python lists, but basically just a collection of things to plot. So time points one, uh, one, two, three, four, and position, and we could plot um, 0, uh, 50, 150, 300. Um, well, whoops, I'll put all this code in one cell. And then we could do plot dot plot of time and position, and then we can you set the X label to be time in hours and the Y label to be in 
position in columns, something like this. And then we could also do plot.title is you know our first plot. Uh, right. I only have so this has uh, five numbers, and this only has four numbers. So that's why the error is saying that I can't plot. If I'm making a two-dimensional plot, I need to have the same amount of numbers in both samples that I'm trying to plot. So the first one has five, and the second one has four. So I will add um, so we get something like this. No. Okay, um, so matplotlib, fantastic library, been around for quite a while, um, great documentation, um, loads of examples. Um, I learned how to plot in matplotlib by kind of just going through this gallery of examples and then looking for a particular plot that I wanted to kind of replicate. Um, and then, so like here's an example of, um, you know, plotting different aspects of some time series of a signal, um, converting it into uh, the frequency domain, and then plotting different things, aspects of it. And so then there's code here that shows you how to do that. So um, best way to learn matplotlib is, is by doing, by going to there, going to the documentation, finding an example, running the code. Um, so like in particular, uh, we should be able to just copy this code. So I'll click this little copy icon here, copy it. And then, so pasted example from uh, matplotlib gallery. And so there's the, the code. So I will put um, uh, the link uh, to that. Take advantage of having the markdown cells, and I'll just embed a link in the notebook. Um, and then you'll have this link later when I upload it to GitHub. So this is more involved. It has you know several subplots, different colors, labels, things like that. Um, right. OK, so we can plot data directly from uh, a pandas data frame. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, work with our, uh, well, let's use a different data set than what they use in the, um, uh, in the lecture notes. So let's, let's, we haven't worked with Asian data yet. That will allow us to look at uh, Saudi Arabia if we want. So let's do that. So we're going to read CSV data gap minder uh, Asia. GDP, no, Gapminder GDP Asia dot CSV, and the index column is the country. Okay, and let's look at the first few lines. So there's our first few lines Afghanistan and China. Um, we can look at the last few lines with the tail. So Yemen, Taiwan, and let's look at um, uh, da, 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 da. look at we can describe. So just to so these are now computing. Um, descriptive statistics for each year. Um, if we wanted to, let's 
So we can also do uh, descriptive statistics, statistics for each uh, uh, country. By here's another example of, of where transposing the data set comes in handy. So we can transpose the data set and now we can get descriptive statistics for each country. Um, okay. So what did I want? So this is on plotting. So let's look at um, let's look at from our data frame, we want to select out a particular country. Sorry, from our Asia data frame, we want to select out a particular country. Let's do um, Saudi Arabia. And we want to use all of the years. OK, so here is the GDP per capita um, in Saudi Arabia for all of the years. And then let's plot. So we can, so this is a technique where, so we could write this, we could just do this. And so this will plot uh, GDP per capita um, for Saudi Arabia um, across time. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit messy down here. So we're going to talk about how we can clean that up a little bit. Um, we can also do something called, so this is called method chaining, where we're calling dot loc followed by dot plot followed by any other kind of thing. Um, I tend to like to line these things up on the dot just to make it um, more visually um, concise. And so in order to do execute a multi-line command in Python, you need to surround the command in parentheses. Yeah, so if Python is white space sensitive. And so we need to make sure that it ignores this white space here. And we do that by adding these parentheses. Um, and we can also add, since this returns an axis subplot object, we can actually just use this underscore to capture this um, axis subplot here so that it doesn't get printed into the screen like this. So we're just kind of iteratively refining this, um, this diagram. So one of the things I want to do is kind of go back up here to where we loaded the data set and clean it up a little bit. So one of the things we, can, we want to do is basically strip out this GDP per cap in 1952 and clean up so that instead of, um, uh, instead of GDP per cap in 1952, it just has the year 1952. So this is kind of an example of data cleaning, data munging, data wrangling that you often encounter in doing data science and machine learning. And, what's called extract, transform, and load, or ETL kind of workflows. You need to do quite a lot of this, this type of stuff. So we're going to take our uh, Asia data frame and look at the columns. OK. Now, um, the columns have a way to access the strings. So each of these in entries in the column index is a string. So there is a string method that allows you to access and apply string methods to each element in the column. And so what we can do is we can actually strip out from the string, the beginning um, GDP per cap underscore. And that leaves us with strings representing uh, these integers. And we can get rid of that by using an as type method um, to cast these strings to integers. And now we can um, reassign the columns value to be this new index that we've created. But 
Asia. And now we've gotten rid of these messy GDP per cap 1952. And what this means is that now um, our data looks a bit neater, but also our plots are going to look cleaner. So now we have just the years down here, which makes a lot more, a lot more sense. Okay. Um, so we can add, um, so the, uh, the, you can go in here and add uh, labels. So we can do plot dot um, X label as time or maybe year. Um, y label as um, GDP per capita. Um, and again, each of these, these methods returns a, a value. So we can just kind of suppress the return values so that we um, get rid of that um, printing the type to the screen, I guess, or not to the screen, to the, uh, the output, notebook output. Okay, so there's lots of different plot styles that are available. So this is kind of the default matplotlib color scheme, but you can change the style. So there is a color scheme in R called, uh, there's a plotting package in the R community called ggplot. Um, and it has a, uh, a color scheme that's very popular. So um, you can change the plot style to uh, uh, ggplot. And then we could do this same plot again. Um, so that gives us a slightly different plot. Um, if, what else could we do? So there is another, even another plot style. Uh, it called? That's not it. So style dot available. So there is a, another style that I wanted to show you, which I kind of like, um, but I've got the name wrong. So let's see if I can figure this out. So C style dot available. So plot dot style dot available. And so this is giving the list of everything that is available. And um, hmm. so they have different kinds of, um, of ones that are available. So Seaborn is another plotting library that has a lot of, of color schemes. And so they've built in a lot of Seaborn color schemes if you like those. So there's the ggplot one. 538 is a color scheme from a, a politic, the US politics blog. Um, so let's try that one, see what this one looks like. No. So that's a slightly different style. Um, so I'll actually, so one of the things I didn't show you about Jupyter Lab is you can rearrange the, um, the order of the cells by kind of dragging and dropping. So I can drag this cell uh, up here. Oh, where'd it go? Um, let's try that again. Uh, plot dot style dot available. And I can drag this up here. There we go. Oh, somehow it got up here. I just deleted. Okay. So, uh, here is a, a list of the available styles. Um, so you can look at some of these others and experiment with yourself to see uh, which ones you might like. Yeah, I'll just save that. Okay. Um, so you can customize, um, I'll try a different one. 
here. Uh, well, let's go back to the the um, Push to see more. You can customize this by passing in uh, arguments into the plot method uh, um, directly. Um, or you can plot data from, sorry, you can plot data from the data frame uh, directly. So instead of calling this plot method, what we can do is. Um, we can do like a plot dot plot of um, data dot or sorry um, Asia data frame dot columns, and then the data here, and then we could make the line to be a green dashed line. Asia. Yeah, but um, typically I would just use the plot method on the data frame and not this way. But just kind of showing you. Um, you know, we could plot many. Um, many lines together. So if we wanted to do, like if we go back to this, uh, this way, and then did um, Saudi Arabia. And so what would be a country that starts with less than S and goes to Saudi Arabia, but not, uh, maybe not too many countries. So, um, all right, well, let's look at it like this. So. Asia data frame, and we can look at the index to get the countries. So Saudi Arabia is here. So if we did Saudi Arabia to, we'll just plot the S's, Syria, and then plot them for all the years. Um, that's not what we want. We want to transpose this. So we want to do, we first we select out the data and then we transpose it. And then we plot it. There we go. And so you can see how much Singapore's uh, GDP per capita has grown over the last uh, 50, 60 years uh, relative to. Uh, you know, Sri Lanka and Syria who are, who are way down here, and then Saudi has had a much more uh, mixed uh, experience where we had uh, Saudi had lots of growth in GDP per capita, and then things have kind of gone down. Okay. Um, what else? So, some scatter plots. So there's some more, more plotting examples in here. I'm conscious of the time, so I don't want to spend too, uh, too much more time, I think, plotting um, examples. But I do want to give you some time to play around with the exercises. So I'll go ahead and set my, uh, set my timer. So if you want to take a few minutes and play around with, with some of these plotting exercises, um, uh, please do so. Uh, and I will just answer some questions. If you, uh, if you have any questions. There's some really interesting exercises um, 
that are worth looking at correlations, more correlations. Um, um, and even more correlations, I think, uh, are good exercises that walk you through not just a lot of plotting. Um, so Muna is asking a question, the dash, uh, or you mean the underscore equals? So, okay. So let me share my screen again. Okay, so Muna is asking a question about what is this doing? And it's not necessary. So if I, so the thing is, is that each of these functions that I'm calling return an object. So if I instead change this to A, B, and C, then I, if I look at what is A, well, A is actually an access subplot object, which is basically returning the object that stores this plot. B is an object that represents the text associated with this X label. So it's basically a position, um, the a position in the X, uh, I'm not sure what this is, maybe the font size and then the actual font itself. So it's, and then C is the same, but for the, um, for the Y label, Y axis label. So if you needed to get a hold of either the plot itself or the X axis or the Y axis, then you can get a, store these objects and then do things with them. But typically you, don't necessarily need to do that. And so what I do is um, uh, I put these underscores here because if you just leave them off entirely, then what gets printed is this thing here, which is for, is this here, C. And I don't like it to be printed in the notebook because it's it, it kind of clashes with this nice graph. And so one of the things that you can do is you could just put an underscore. This underscore will then capture that last object and pretend that it's like a Python variable almost. It's a bit of a, you can think of it as just a hack to avoid something getting printed that I don't want to get printed in the notebook. But I, I tend to start started doing it as a habit to where if any function, like plotting function kind of returns an object that I don't care about, I just put this underscore here to, to capture that object, um, but in a variable that I'm not going to use. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, um, any other questions? If not, then just bear with me one second. Okay. Then what I've done, let me share my screen. Then what I've done here is I've copied the uh, the code from more correlations, which is plotting this data set for the entire world. Um, and I'm going to walk you through it and kind of just explain um, explain what's going on. So what we're doing here is, is we're loading this data frame like we've been doing all along, but now we're creating, and this is an example of creating a scatter plot. And here we're passing in, um, so now that I've loaded in this data, a data all data frame, let's, let's take a look at it. Okay. So this data all data frame has countries and continents and then GDP per capita 
And then it has some other information as well. So population um, and life expectancy, uh, the other variables. So what we're plotting is a scatter plot of GDP per capita in 2007 and life expectancy in 2007. And then the size of the, the, the scatter, the point in the scatter plot, we're making it being proportional to millions of people. So that's the, um, the data all. And actually, this should probably be loc in here, just to be more, uh, more specific. Um, Uh, oh, right, because it needs, um, there we go. Okay. So that's just an example of a slightly more uh, elaborate plot. If you um, um, read through the documentation of the um, of the plot option, um, then you can find out kind of what all of these things uh, does. So here you can see the different kinds of plots. So we use scatter plot. We have been making line plots, which are the default, but you can have other kinds of plots as well. Um, and then the X and Y is a label or position from a data frame. So that's why we use a label um, GDP per cap uh, and life expectancy. And then if we go through here, there should be something about S, which is being the size of the keyword options. So it looks like you would have to dig into the documentation for the matplotlib plotting method to find what this S does, but the S is for the size of the, the scatter. Um, and I don't think that you can just pass in a label here. I think you actually have to pass in uh, the data. So this part um, is possibly not uh, data frame aware. Let's see. Oof, so it is, but that doesn't do what we wanted. And probably the reason is that population is in numbers of people, which is really big. And we need to rescale that um, by dividing by a million in order to get a sensible scale. So I'll call this marker size. And then just to remind you that S is market size. There we go. Okay. All right. Um, so let's move, let's move right along. So uh, we're doing pretty well. We've got about half of the material covered um, and we only had half a day's workshop. All right. So what I would like to do now is jump ahead uh, quite a bit because I want to stick with the theme of, of data analysis. Um, so I'm going to jump over this episode on lists. So lists are a very important data structure in Python. Um, we're going to use lists um, for the last episode that I'm going to cover today. Um, but I'll just mention the key features of lists as I go along. And if you want more practice with lists from the basics, then please come back and take a look at this episode. Um, similarly, I'm going to skip for loops, um, in part because I'm going to use for loops in this last episode that I want to cover with you. Um, and uh, I'll try to explain the key features of for loops as, as I go along. But if you want the from the basics details, then please come back and take a look at this episode. And similarly, I'm going to skip conditionals. And I'll talk about conditionals as we, um, the, the syntax of conditionals, if we need them um, in this episode. 
this is what I want to spend the last um, you know, 15 minutes or so uh, with you before we take questions on, um, because it's a nice follow on to the data analysis work that we've been doing so far. Looping over data sets. So a common, uh, a common task that you will have um, doing scientific computing or data analysis, uh, data science, machine learning, whatever, you're, whatever it is that you're, anytime you're working with data is you're going to have lots of data sets and you're gonna to wanna to do a similar task to each of the data sets. And this is how uh, I'm gonna show you kind of how to do that with um, the for loops and conditional statements and data loading here with pandas. Okay. So let's suppose that we want to load a bunch of data sets and then we're going to do some analysis on each of the data sets. So we have pandas is already imported and we know we have some file names. So um, file names. So I'm gonna create a Python list and a Python list is just a collection of, of things in Python. It's created with square brackets and then in a list, a list can have different types of objects. So it could be strings and integers or integers and, and uh, floating point numbers or any kind of object can be, uh, can be included in a list. In this case, we're gonna have a list of strings representing file paths. So we'll put file paths data, um, gapminder, uh, GDP, Africa, CSV, and gapminder, GDP, Asia, CSV, and this should be data. Slash. Okay, so we're gonna have a we're gonna have a list of file names. Now this only has two file names, but you know the same principle could apply if there were a million file names or something like that. Obviously, it would just be really annoying to write all those million files out in the list uh, manually. And I'll show you in a moment how to automate that process. But now we have our list of file names. We want to process these file names using a for loop. So in Python, the syntax for a for loop is for um, some variable name, which is called the loop variable, in a collection of, of things, typically but not always a list, that you want to process. And I will call this file names. So for file name and file name. So each time through the loop, the file name is going to take on one of the values in the list of things that we're iterating over, or that we're looping over. So first it will take this, and then it will take this, and so on and so forth. And we can test that by just putting a simple loop body, so the code that is indented one, two, three, four spaces underneath the uh, for loop is called the, underneath the for line is called the loop body. And here, let's just print out the file name. Okay, and this colon is important. So don't forget this colon. So the things that are important syntactically is the for, the in, and the colon, and then this indentation. But if you put the colon, then Python, uh, IPython or Jupyter will automatically give you the indentation. So if we run this code, then we, go through and print the file name each time. Okay, so that's fine. So um, let's do something besides um, printing the file name. Let's actually load the data. So we're going to uh, read CSV from the file name and when we're going to use the index column is country. And then instead of printing the file name, we'll just print um, df.head. So the first five rows of each data frame. So now this is taking a little longer because it has to load, but now it's printing the first five rows and it has to print all the columns. Um, so notice that you get basically um, Algeria, Angola, Benin, Botswana, Burkina Faso, and then these are the first five rows in the Africa CSV data for all of 2000 up till 2007. <clears throat> and then um, why did it not load? 
Uh, what happened to the Asian countries? Ah, you can tell that I'm tired because I'm not reading properly. So uh, here are the African countries, and now this is the Asian countries. So that's the second data set. Um, maybe we could even set that up more, more particularly by saying print uh, file name. And now, so here's the Africa data, and then here's the start of the Asian data. Okay. Now, th this is a bit uh, annoying in that with two data, two data, uh, data sets, it's okay to write out all the, the names manually, but it would be better if we didn't have to do that. So one of the things that we can do is there's a library uh, in the Python standard library called glob, and you can actually use glob to um, extract um, uh, extract file names that match a certain pattern, because this is a common thing that you uh, want to do in data analysis. So if you look at these, um, these file names, the pattern is that they all start with um, this, and they all end in this. So we can replace this with a star, just like we did with wildcard pattern matching in our shell course. And now glob.glob .glob is going to grab Africa, Asia, uh, Americas, Europe, Oceania, Asia, and those are all of the the files that were there, except for the Gapminder all data set, which doesn't match that pattern. So here we have one, two, three, four, five files that match that pattern. The Gapminder all is a different pattern, even though it's a CSV file. So it's not included in this, um, and it doesn't match that pattern there. So it doesn't end up in file names. This is super handy. If you, um, I can't remember, someone here, uh, one of our, the participants was talking about reading data files that were text files off the spectrometer. Um, that machine might generate, I don't know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of data files. And you could grab, if all of those were in a set of directories, you could grab all those files at once and start processing them with a for loop um, using this, this kind of idea. Um, so it's very, very powerful and very useful. Okay, so okay, so that is a, about as far as I think we're going to be able to get today, because um, I want to leave some time for for Q and A um, and to talk about the the other uh, episodes and the Python lessons I didn't get to, uh, didn't get to discuss. So. Are there any questions um, about uh, what I just covered? Okay, so how to convert a notebook to a script? Um, this is a very good question. So uh, uh, Dahlia has a, a question about converting a notebook to a script. And um, there is a tool for that. Um, well, I don't often use it, so I need to think for a minute about what's the best way to show you how to do that um, here. So, okay. So um, let me share my screen again. So let's suppose that um, I went through in this notebook and I created a whole bunch of analysis that um, I prototyped and tested interactively in the notebook, but now I want to convert it to a script that could run as a batch job. Um, what would, so the way that you would convert it is you can go to uh, file, export notebook as, and then executable script. 
and um, oh, actually, this is going to export it um, from your uh, from inside the Jupyter server down to a file that you can store uh, on your desktop. So if I just call this uh, sandbox Python script, so you could save it. So this is going to uh, basically export um, the notebook as a Python script onto your file system, which is, might not be, oops, might not be exactly what you want. Um, but that's one way uh, to do it. Um, another way is there is a command line tool. Uh, just give me a moment to look at up, uh, which oops, convert. Um, let me, let me just test this real quick and then I will, um, make sure that it works. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. So the question was, how do you convert a um, uh, an IPython notebook or a Jupyter sorry Jupyter notebook to a script? And you can do that using a tool called Jupyter NB Convert. And um, so if you create a, a terminal, uh, I'm just going to clear this. All right, let's see where, where we are. So we're in our home directory. So if we uh, change into our uh, introduction to Python directory, um, and then we want to go in the notebooks directory. Okay. So I just tested the tool. So there's a, a, a sandbox.py script there. So I'm just going to remove that. Okay. So now the tool is called so Jupyter, which you know you can launch a Jupyter server with Jupyter Lab. But now we're going to use another uh, subcommand called notebook convert, nb convert. And if you look at the help menu for this command, um, it has uh, quite a lot of things that you can do. So you can convert your notebook to PDFs, to HTML, to uh, Markdown, or to LaTeX. Um, there's a whole ecosystem of tools designed around using this command to take a notebook and maybe compile it into a paper, into a PDF paper and LaTeX, or all sorts of stuff, writing books with Jupyter Notebooks. They use this, this tool. We just want to do something really simple, which is basically export the format to a script. So the way that we, we do that is, I'm just going to clear this now, is, um, nb convert to script. And then we need to add either the, the path to the notebook that we want to convert. So sandbox ipy nb is what we want to convert. And we hit enter. And now our notebook has been converted to a script. 
And if we look in the introduction to Python notebooks directory, um, so here's our sandbox.py script that we just created. And if you just take a look at it, what has happened is effectively all of the so all of the the stuff in the notebook has been somewhat commented out. And the only thing that's left is basically the input code cells. And so now it should be possible to execute this, uh, this script and it would just run these commands one after the other after the other until it either hit an error, like this would have been a syntax error that I demonstrated during the uh, an earlier episode this, this afternoon. Um, but if this was an actual, you know, notebook that all the code worked from top to bottom, then you could just run it as a script and you'd be good to go. So maybe if I wanted to, let me just make a simple demonstration of that. So if I just create um, a new notebook and I will call this, um, I'll rename it and call uh, uh, test notebook to convert to script. Okay, and in this test notebook, I'm just gonna do two things. So I'm going to import, um, I'm gonna import the math library, and then I'm going to do, um, Um, math dot cosine of math dot pi. Um, what does this do? Part of the square root of the input. That's not what I want. Um, and right, and then print math dot cosine so, uh, of math dot pi. Okay. So when I execute this script from top to bottom, it does it imports math, it runs this command, which in a notebook prints out the result, and then I print the same the result of the same command and then it prints the result. And what I wanna show you is that when I compile this to a script and run it, I think that only this, this is going to print because there's a manual print statement here. This is going to be executed, but won't print. So let's test this. So we'll go back to our, our terminal and we will do uh, Jupyter and be convert It's hard to type with a laggy keyboard. NB convert to script and then uh, test notebook convert to script. Okay. And now if we go over here and refresh, so here's the script that we just did. And now if I create uh, an IPython console, then I should be able to um, run the test notebook convert to script. Yeah, and notice that instead of having two minus ones, only that second minus one actually prints it out because if we look at this script, then this is the script that was created from this notebook. So you can see what happens is that when this um, script gets run, we import the math library, we execute this code, but we actually don't do anything with the result. So that result is not gonna be displayed anywhere. It's just computed and lost. And then we actually print this out. So that's why, even in the, in the notebook, we see two outputs, 
uh, when we run the script, uh, we only see one. So that's important because if you forget those print statements, if you're, if you're creating a notebook that you want to convert later to a script, make sure you use print statements because that, that will uh, ensure that what you think is going to get printed will actually get printed when you run the script. So that's a very thorough response, but hopefully that answers, uh, uh, answers the question. Um, I guess one other thing is that you can execute. So I showed you how to execute a Python script from a console, um, but you can actually also execute Python scripts from the command line too, by just running Python and then the script that you want to run. So that's another way to execute the script. <clears throat> Okay, any other questions? So uh, Moaz is asking, is there a way in Python to set a folder path for data instead of writing the path every time? Um, hmm. So I can't, I can't think of anything off the, off the top of my, my head that I would want to publicly advocate for you to do. Let's put it that way. So I could think of a few hacky ways that might work, but I don't think they would be good ideas in general. And so I don't want to lead anyone astray by suggesting something at five in the afternoon um, after a long day's worth of teaching, that might end up to not be a good idea. So I won't. Um, so sorry, I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, I guess real quickly, um, what I want to do is encourage you. I know we didn't get a chance to cover um, to cover everything, but um, the important things from afternoon are, I would say, writing functions or of the remaining lessons, the writing functions is, is one that's really important because um, you will need to write a lot of Python functions. And so this covers the basics of how to define and write your own functions, um, functions that don't take any arguments, functions that take arguments, arguments and keyword arguments and things like that. Um, so functions, lists, uh, for loops, and conditionals are kind of the main topics of kind of the Python language that we didn't get to cover today. Um, we focused more on the data analysis part of things, which um, is intentional because um, in three weeks time, after we cover Git and SQL, um, we're going to do um, an introduction to scikit-learn, uh, machine learning with scikit-learn, and then an introduction to image classification uh, with Keras. And, and both of those lectures, we're going to need to work with data more than we're going to need to be writing for loops and, and conditionals and things like that. So I left these out because, um, not because they're not important. They're all very important. I would encourage you to take the time to go over them um, in your spare time. Um, OK. And if you're really interested in a deep dive to pandas, definitely check out um, both the Pandas documentation, but also uh, volume two, or not volume two, um, second edition of the Python for Data Analysis book. It's really great. OK, uh, that's it for me. I don't have anything else. Um, I want to thank uh, the team from uh, MyBinder uh, and BinderHub who provided the computing resources uh, that we use today. It would really not have been possible for me to um, to, to teach a course like this to this many people spread across um, the region uh, without uh, the support of my binder. And then for the research uh, computing here at KAUST for providing the, um, the, the KAUST Binder Hub instance for, for use by KAUST participants. So I hope you guys learned, uh, hope you guys learned a fair bit about Python. I'm sorry we couldn't cover everything. And um, we'll send out a link to the, the, the YouTube video tomorrow as soon as it's posted. 
Um, also a feedback form. So we please complete the, the feedback form. It gives us great information on how to improve the course uh, for next semester uh, and any future courses that we're teaching this semester. And um, look forward to seeing you next week um, or in some future uh, KBL data science training. So thank you very much. Bye guys. We'll be there. Will they be, be there another uh, session next week? So yeah, so next Tuesday afternoon, uh, we'll be covering introduction to version control with Git. And then the following Tuesday, um, introduction to SQL for data science. And then, then I think we have a break because it's uh, uh, spread, spring break here at KAUST. And so we're gonna take the next week off and then we'll come back in the last part of, um, of March and early April with the um, machine learning with scikit-learn and image classification with Keras. So, so how we will get uh, the notification? I mean, the, today we just get it, the announcement today. I mean, before the session, a few hours before the session. Oh, are you so joining there from, a way to are you, are you joining from KAUST? Yes. Okay. So, um, so tomorrow, the feedback link will go out to all of you, and that, that will include information about registering for future courses. Um, so you can get those links tomorrow. Um, so if you haven't registered for any of the remaining sessions, you, all the links will come to you in the email tomorrow, and you can register for those. Um, uh, here at Cal, we've been advertising these sessions fairly frequently. So. Um, in different places, but I think there was an all hands announcement that went out um, just earlier this afternoon or this morning rather. Um, so I'm glad you were able to slide in. I probably personally, if that had been me, I probably would have missed that announcement, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, it was the last minute and I said, okay, I mean, I would like to attend, so. Sure, so you'll, you'll receive an email tomorrow with registration links for the rest of the, the semester. Great, thank you, appreciate You're it. You're most welcome, have a good evening. Cool. All right, bye guys.